Hello, everybody. I hope that since the last time we have met that you have actually been studying hard. And as you can see, today I am sitting in eastern Long Island in front of this incredibly beautiful salt marsh. And it's just put me in such a good mood to talk to you about the subjects I want to today, which are electricity and hydrogen fuel cells. So let's get started on that. Electricity deserves special mention because it is universally important in our lives. And in fact, it's probably the one thing that separates our modern existence from the existence of people 150 years ago, how pervasive the use of electricity is in our life compared to the lack of use of energy in the lives of people a mere 100, 150 years ago. And still today in many parts of the globe where electrification hasn't happened. And the interesting thing about electricity is that it has to be generated from other forms of energy. And for this reason, it's sometimes called a secondary energy source. Many of the energy resources that we will review in this course, the fossil fuel resources as well as the alternatives that you all will talk about, are used primarily to generate electricity. For example, nuclear power, its primary application is to generate electric power. And the same is true for wind power. So we need to know a little bit about what electricity is and how it is generated. So let's start with what is electricity. If you can get electrons to flow, that is called an electric current. And we commonly get electrons to flow in a wire. And we measure the current as the rate at which electrons flow through the wire. Now the great thing about moving electrons is not only are they moving, but they are carrying energy with them. And they can carry different amounts of energy with them. Voltage is the term we use to quantify the amount of energy available per unit of electrons. A higher voltage means that the electrons have more energy to give. And I should say that electric technologies are machines that take that energy in those electrons and turn them into all sorts of other applications. For example, a rotary beater that you might use to bake a cake turns the electric energy into the rotation of the beaters. Or your computer, where the electric energy is turned into the storage and manipulation of data. Electricity has a, a huge number of advantages. First of all, it's easy to transport around through wires. You don't have to go to the electricity store, you just have to be connected. It's available when needed. You just, you don't have to turn anything on per se. It, it, you can just plug something in uh, or flip a switch and the electricity is there. You, have, you don't have to do anything, it's provided for you. It can be stored in portable devices through the use of batteries and that's a great advantage. And the energy supplied can exactly match the job and this is important. You're not bringing a, a jackhammer to push a thumbtack into a board, so to speak energy can exactly match the job. So how do we make electricity? From virtually every energy source that we use to make electricity, it is done in a very similar manner. So what you see here is a picture of a turbine. And the turbine consists of a rotor here, and it consists of a magnet here and a set of wires. So the energy source spins the turbine, and the turbine turns what's called the generator. This whole box is the ge generator. And inside the generator is that bundle of wires and that magnet. And you can either spin the wires within the magnet or the magnets around the wires. It doesn't really matter. What matters is the relative motion. And you generate a voltage in the wire. In other words, you generate high energy electrons and now that they have the energy, they will flow downhill, so to speak, to areas of lower voltage. And in that flow, in that current, you can extract the energy from the electrons and use them to do things such as beat your eggs or run your computer. Now, electricity travels from its source to where it is used by an amazing piece of infrastructure called the power grid. And the power grid is so pervasive, you have seen it but you may not have recognized it as such, or you may not have thought deeply about it. In the United States, it consists of more than 450,000 miles of high voltage power lines 
plus another 160,000 miles of local transmission lines. And they are connected in a grid-like structure. That means that there is not a single path, but it is a net or grid-like structure. And as a result, the source of electricity can be hundreds of miles away from where it is used. That's great. That means you don't have to transfer energy sources very far often to make it, and then you can transport it. But it also can cause problems, such as when the pollution problems are in one community and the usage is far away, far downstream, where nobody really realizes the damage caused by the pollutants. What are the components of a grid? Well, the power plants generate electricity using turbines. Just as I showed you before, those are rotated by an energy source, typically fossil fuels, but it could also be nuclear energy or the flowing water of a river and hydroelectric power, as we will see in one of the talks that we're going to have. Electric power leaves the plant, and then it is stepped up to a very high voltage through a series of technologies and it will be raised to 150,000 to 765,000 volts by what's called the transformer substation. And then the electricity is carried by the so-called high voltage transmission lines, and I will show you a picture of those in a second. They're coming up. And you've all seen high voltage transmission lines. And so the reason we do this is because high voltage is a very efficient way to transport electric energy over long distances without losing energy in the transport, without much energy loss. Here are some of the most high tension of the high tension wires, high voltage of the high voltage wires. And these, I believe, are from China. And I thought it was a beautiful photograph. When it comes time for us to use electric power, the voltage must be stepped down to a reasonable voltage that won't kill you if you get accidentally shocked. So normally it's stepped down to about 240 volts. And indeed, that is usually the service line coming into your house. And you may indeed have a few appliances that use 240 volts, such as some air conditioning units use that and refrigerators can use that. But most of your appliances are running at about 110, 120 volts, which is coming out of the wall socket in your house. From the substation, that steps down the voltage. There is a grid of transmission wires that runs through each district, and a wire must be attached to the electric system of each user. So you have to have an electric connection coming into your house. Even at only 240 volts, the power grid has the potential to supply very large amounts of energy very rapidly to users. And as you might imagine, that can be very dangerous if the flow gets too much. The grid doesn't know the difference between high usage and short circuits. And short circuits are when your wires touch the ground and where there is now virtually no resistance to the current. And so the current flows exceedingly rapidly. And so the potential to deliver huge amounts of energy to one place at one time is very high. And of course, you know that when a lot of energy is delivered to one place at one time, it can cause all sorts of hazards, intense amounts of heat, burns, fires, even explosive type conditions could happen if there's a fuel source nearby. Thus, the electricity for each user runs through a fuse box, the old fashioned way, or a circuit breaker. And these things are designed to cut off the flow of electricity if the current gets dangerously high. So in each application, the fuses or the circuit breakers are designed to recognize when there's exceedingly high current and shut that off very rapidly so no one gets hurt and fires don't occur. The one downside of electricity is that the grid cannot store energy. And that means that power companies must be able to respond to demand relatively quickly. And they need to be able to do that by increasing the output of each turbine or by bringing more turbines online and doing that quickly. The alternative is that the whole system shuts down and you get a blackout. So we're not going to go into the idea of a blackout, and I'll leave that for you to look up on your own if you'd like, or to study in a physics class of some sort or technology class. But what this means is that the power companies have to look at the aggregate demand for electricity for each day. And we're going to see what that looks like on the next slide. 
So here we have the demand for electric current from New England on October 22nd, 2010. And I want you to take a second to just look at this, maybe pause the video when I'm done talking, and see what pattern you've noticed here. Okay, so you're back now. Well, what you probably noticed is that at nighttime, which is right here from zero o'clock to about 5.30 in the morning, there is low demand. And then as people wake up and get going, the demand ramps up. It's called the morning ramp. After that, the load is pretty consistent. The demand is pretty consistent throughout the day until you finally, about 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night, you get the highest demand of the day. And I'll leave you to figure out why that would be, especially in October in New England. And then starting about 6.30 or 7, the load continues to decrease for the rest of the day until midnight or so when it reaches its low or reaches very near its low. So that's the typical demand. I should also point out that peak demand is highest during hot summer days. And I'm going to leave you to figure also out why that would be. Why would peak demand be the highest on summer days? And it occurs at about the same time, somewhere between about 5 and 8 o'clock in the afternoon. So what's going on there? See if you can figure that out. Bring it to class if you can. These spikes in demand are challenging for power companies and put a lot of stress on the power grid. Thus, companies, what they do to respond to that is they change their price in response to demand. And the goal of changing the price is to try to smooth the demand throughout the day. So electric energy prices are higher when demand is high, and they're lower when demand is low. And that is a price signal that, hey, if you possibly can, use electricity at the times when it's cheaper. Most of the electric infrastructure was built around the two decades after World War II, and it's getting old now. And now that we have digital technologies, many people have realized that digital technologies could, if they're installed in the power grid and if they're installed in appliances that consume electricity, that they could develop a lot of desirable properties on the grid. And they call this the smart grid because of the two-way communication between users and producers. <laughs> The great thing about the smart grid is everybody believes that it has the potential to decrease stress on the grid, which means that will increase the performance of the grid and decrease the cost of maintaining the grid. And it has the potential to smooth demand over the course of the day, which also decreases stress on the grid. So this is all excellent for the future of electricity as it gets uh, smartified. And as I said earlier, the two-way communication between producers and consumers will be able to anticipate increased demand. And the other thing that it will be able to do is encourage the shift of power usage to times when demand is less. I mean, imagine appliances that automatically run at night when demand is low and schedule to use energy in the low demand times. I do not understand all that much about the smart grid, but that is an interesting thing to keep your eye on in newspaper articles to see what the future holds. So that is what I want you to understand about electricity. And I think if you can comprehend what I'm saying, you will appreciate electric energy and you will be better able to understand uh, the experience you have with electric energy and you will be better able to understand the issues that arise from energy production as they concern electricity. The next thing I want to talk to you about is hydrogen as a fuel source. You may have heard of hydrogen fuel cells, and you may have even seen cars that run on hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas, H2, contains a large amount of energy. It reacts explosively with oxygen to form water, and the explosion is the indicator that the hydrogen contains a lot of energy. The release of that energy, if it could be done in a controlled, non-explosive way, could be used in various applications, and thus H2 is an intriguing source of energy. It's also incredibly abundant on Earth, but not in the form of H2. So it's abundant in water, H2O, but not as hydrogen gas itself. So you have to make hydrogen gas 
to use it as an energy source. The advantages of using hydrogen as a fuel source is that it can be produced from any electrical source by electrolysis. And I believe most of you saw electrolysis of water in your chemistry classes. And you saw that you could easily run a current through water and get oxygen gas to form and hydrogen gas to form. When you burn hydrogen fuel, when you combine it with oxygen, the waste product is water, so it does not create any greenhouse gases and very few other pollutants are created. It can be used in vehicles and it can be scaled up or down to uh, large applications or small. The disadvantages though are considerable. Hydrogen is highly volatile and explosive, so it requires special storage. And it is highly inefficient to produce, meaning it takes a lot of energy to make it. So you're gonna waste a lot of energy in making hydrogen gas. So that's one thing that I think really kills hydrogen as a fuel source. But the second thing is most hydrogen on Earth is currently produced using natural gas and it creates large amounts of CO2. So making uh, hydrogen gas actually has a very large CO2 footprint. Let's just look though at how this might work. So the whole idea here is that you use electricity and that requires a fuel source to do electrolysis on water where you capture the hydrogen, you let the oxygen just go off into the atmosphere, no harm adding a little oxygen to the atmosphere, and then you store it and then you combust it and you use that energy for whatever you need an energy source for. The most common application currently is to run hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Here's how the fuel cell works. So you can see a picture of it here on the, on the screen. And it runs actually like a battery in that there are two electrodes and the hydrogen fuel comes in and it interacts with the electrode and sends an electron through the electrode and then it creates um, hydrogen ion in here. And then the hydrogen ion goes to the to the other electrode where it combines with oxygen and now this low energy electron to make water as the waste product. So a vehicle that has a hydrogen fuel cell requires hydrogen from a tank and oxygen from the air. It's similar to a battery, but you never have to uh, renew the battery because the reactants are supplied from an outside source. So unlike a battery which contains all its chemical energy within it and then that eventually is used up you just keep putting a new hydrogen tank on your car or filling up your tank at the hydrogen gas station and you can keep using your fuel cell. But as I say, the impediments to using hydrogen fuel cells in cars are still huge, mainly because the creation of H2 gas is so inefficient and it is so, so expensive. So I don't think we're gonna see widespread adoption of hydrogen fuel anytime soon. I want to say something about energy storage quickly for a second, and this will be a point emphasized in one of the talks. A big problem with many kinds of alternative energy sources is that they're only available intermittently from time to time. For example, solar energy is only available during the day, and wind energy is only available when it's windy. Similarly, uh, certain sources such as nuclear power and coal fire plants are best run continuously and at a very high level and they're not very well suited to meeting the changes in peak demand. Thus there is a need for storage technologies where you can store that energy in another form and then use it later to regenerate the electricity. And the problem is that most of the current energy storage techniques are pretty inefficient. That is much energy is lost when the energy is stored and then when it's reconverted back into electricity. And this is as you will recognize the second law of thermodynamics, which says every time energy is converted from one form to another, some of it is lost as useless heat to the environment. So there's a big research opportunity right now into the development of new forms of energy storage. And some of the current areas of research, and we will probably hear about some of these in our talks in, in the coming weeks, are superconducting magnetic energy storage, compressed air energy storage, electrochemical energy storage, kinetic energy storage, molten salt energy storage, and water energy storage. And another one that could happen is 
uh, using the extra energy to create hydrogen and storing it as compressed hydrogen gas. So there are all sorts of ways to look into energy storage. We're now at the point where we're about to look at fossil fuels. That will be the next talk. But I just couldn't close this talk without talking about what I've called the energy conundrum. And I just discovered that somebody has written a book called The Energy Conundrum, which precisely captures what, what I was thinking when I, when I wrote this slide several years ago. And that's it. Here's what this book says. Energy is the solution. It is also the problem. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, improved standard of living can be achieved by using more energy. In other words, energy is a very good way to improve the standard of living for a lot of people quickly. And so this is the route that many nations have opted for to affect development. The problem is that increased energy use has a host of environmental problems that come along with it. I think we've seen some of these already, and we've probably only seen the tip of the iceberg by by focusing on uh, climate change, which admittedly is the most important and pressing at this point, making all the others look small. But the other problems are significant as well. If you think about it, people don't want energy per se, but the comforts that come from it. Thus, at some point, humans need to consider how energy is to be used to provide an increased standard of living for all people without destroying the planet. And that's going to be, require a reckoning of where we really need to use energy and where we can forego using energy. I believe that this is going to require significant cooperation, significant planning, significant government, and a significant sense that we as human beings are living on spaceship Earth and need to live this way rather than the ideology which says, I live on this piece of land and I can do whatever I goddamn well please with it. We are going to have to think about how we can live together. What are the things we can forego doing? And what are the things that we absolutely require? I don't think that's a scary process, but I know some people do. I think it's a real opportunity for a deeper sense of engagement in the planet and a deeper sense of engagement with other human beings, which itself will be satisfying for many, many people. So that is the end of today's talk. Until next time, study hard.